Part 2 7. The musical Palmer family arrives by bandwagon at Alamo Ranch. Young Marietta Palmer is not impressed favorably by Richard. The Palmers camp near Sandal House. Richard agrees to take them to Chaco Canyon. Pueblo Bonito. Richard's excitement when he realizes he has found a vast, many-dwelling center of a vanished civilization. They visit Santa Fe. Richard and Talbot Hyde exchange letters planning their next summer's work. With Richard as guide, the bandwagon circles southward into Arizona, crossing the flooded San Juan. Richard asks Marietta to be his wife. The parting at Monticello, Utah. After the Palmers had been to Cliff Palace and several other cliff dwellings, Richard found them a campsite in a box elder grove near Sandal House in Mancos Canyon. With their wagon brought up to the trees and a pair of mules put out to graze, they remained two weeks. The isolation would have been complete except for Richard's occasional appearances, always unannounced, but always as casual as he could make them. These visits, he assured them each time, were only by chance and accidental. Just riding by, he would say breezily, and being so close, I thought I'd stop and see how you folks are fixed. Is everything all right? Marietta and her parents always said they were fine, then suggested he stay a bit and rest his horses. For on these visits, Richard had a pack horse with him, and in spite of his lame excuse of being headed in some other direction, the packs always contained more food than one man could eat in a month. Accepting the Palmer's invitation, though doubtfully, Richard would unhitch the packs and then, opening them, drop the pretense that the food was for anyone but these friends. His explanations were always gra gravely received. And after letting a little time pass, Marietta's mother might propose that it was getting late and Richard should stay for supper. Richard stayed, afterwards around the campfire, when the sky was darkening and the stars beginning to appear, Marietta's father would say, Why don't you take your bedroll off that horse, Richard, and spend the night? We'll have an early breakfast and you can get started then. You won't go far tonight anyway. Richard's visits to the Palmer's camp did not escape notice, as Marietta learned when she rode back to the Alamo Ranch one day when her father was to have the mules reshod. In the blacksmith shop, they encountered a tall, slender young man who eyed them quizzically. This was Jim Etheridge a cowboy who lived on the ranch with his brother, Roe. Marietta came to know him well and once described him. He was a very blonde young man, and although I once saw his hair clean, and it was what they would call now platinum, it always looked gray with dust. His eyes were very light, like boiled gooseberries, and his eyebrows and lashes were whitish, his complexion a sand color. He was quiet, extremely bashful, and seldom had much to say. On this occasion, he overcame his shyness, and as the girl stood waiting for her father, he asked in a drawl, "'Where'd you say you came from?' "'I didn't say,' Marietta smiled, "'but it's from Pawnee County in Kansas, "'a town I bet you've never heard of.' "'Well, now,' Etheridge said with a grin, "'from Pawnee County, "'you know you're the first girl I ever knew, "'who Witchard Retherwell would ride here to yonder to see.' Marietta looked Jim Etheridge in the eye. Mr. Wetherill and my folks are good friends, she said, and I guess we enjoy seeing him any time at all when he can come. Etheridge laughed and said, All right, well, we'll see who likes who, but you don't fool me none. Nights around the fire below Sandal House became occasions to look forward to and remember. Richard had the gift of all true story weavers and could make the images of his enthusiasm come alive in the flickering light and shadows. On these nights particularly, with Marietta listening, he was very talkative. One story that he told of the cliff dwellers moved the girl deeply because it was a tragedy for which he had no explanation. Richard and his brothers and Charlie Mason had been working through a large ruin in a fork of Johnson Canyon when they opened up a kiva. In it, lying on the floor, they found skeletons of four people. A man, a woman, 
a small child about young Burns' age and a little baby. All had died violently. For centuries, the bodies just lay where they had fallen in death. The man had fallen backwards, his legs stretched out into the narrow ventilator shaft through which he may have attempted to escape. Across one of his outflung arms were the remains of the boy, his son, no doubt, and close by the woman and the infant. The skulls of the parent and the boy had been crushed, each by one blow of a stone axe. Whoever used this weapon had dropped it and left it there. Richard found the stone blade in the keep of floor. It fitted perfectly the holes in the skull. The baby's head was so badly shattered only fragments of it were recovered. Nowhere else in the dim, silent cliff dwelling had they found another trace of violence. Then why in one room in a kiva? If the village had been attacked by enemies, wouldn't they have found more dead? To Richard and his brothers, it appeared that this family had been murdered by their own people, but why? As the sparks and pinion smoke curled away, the conversations turned to other places, to desert, canyon, and high mountain country known only to the Navajos, and ancient ruins never explored, but said to equal or surpass even the cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde. They spoke of Pueblo Benito and Chaco Canyon, which neither Richard nor Sidney Palmer had seen and knew only from hearsay. About ten years before, Palmer said, he had brought his wife and Marietta to the modern pueblos along the Rio Grande, stopping at Santa Fe and Albuquerque and asking else everywhere for directions to Benito and other great villages of the Chaco. Almost everyone he questioned either had never heard of the region was or was unable to tell him where Chaco was. All anyone seemed to know was that Chaco Canyon lay somewhere off to the northwest, for far on the other side of the Hemas Mountains. A few warned him against trying to go there. He could cross miles of desert there where there was no water, they said, and enter a country inhabited only by hostile Navajos who would kill him, his wife and his daughter, if they were not lucky enough to die of thirst. Several well-armed men experienced in desert travel in the ways of Indians and finding hidden springs, might succeed in reaching the Chaco and be able to return safely. But for an unarmed Kansan to attempt it in the company of a woman and small child, it would be certain death. And he had reluctantly given up the idea, Palmer said, but some day he might still undertake it. Richard rubbed his chin. He knew the hazards Palmer spoke of were exaggerated that a few white men had found the Chaco without serious trouble and had not been molested. There will be nothing to do at the ranch this winter that Al and John couldn't handle, he said after a moment. From what I've heard, the Navajos down there wouldn't harm anyone. Would you like me to take you? We have no other plans. We would like to, Palmer said, and as easily as this, Richard's future again was shaped. It was early fall, 1895, and Richard wrote Talbot Hyde, I'm going to go to New Mexico for a little while to see if I cannot find some more accessible ruins where I can put in this winter and find a different character of relics. Richard and the Palmers left Alamo Ranch on a frosty October morning outfitting in Durango with supplies for two months, boxes and bags of food weighing a thousand pounds and equal weight of hay and grain for their animals. Of these, there were seven, two big mules, tender and true, drawing the Palmer's wagon, two other mules, Mesa and Canyon, harnessed to Richard's spring wagon, which was to carry the bulk of the load, and three saddle horses responding to the names of Naki, Whiskers, and Rats. They carried no tents, but Richard took several heavy tarpaulins and his own bedroll. The Palmers, as usual, would sleep in their wagon. As important as anything else were the barrels lashed to both wagons, which were for water and could be refilled when they left the settlements on the San Juan. For six days they traveled, at first following the gorge of the Animas, and then climbing out onto the high flat plateau, stretching off southwards in a gradual steady 
descent. The peaks and then the foothills of the La Plata Mountains lay to the west until the country on both sides opened up into a broad valley as they approached the San Juan. They forded that river a short distance east of Farmington on the fourth day and spent that night near the trading post of Dick Simpson, an Englishman who, like Tom Keene, had come to this part of the country seeking adventure, married a Navajo girl, and stayed. One surviving fragment of a diary Marietta kept at the time tells the day following. We drove to Swire's trading store. We felt we were in unexplored country. Old man Swire's, very old and living with his brother. Small stock, very dirty, much pond. Road little used, no Indian wagons, one wagon at store to bring in freight. Secured guide here to take us into the unknown. No road except the old unknown road used by early explorers to San Juan from Santa Fe. Many places so grass-grown we could not find it. Other places entirely washed out. First day to Saya, no water. Spring found next morning. The road amounted to no more than a faint wagon wheel ruts meandering off into sand and bunch grass. Their guide was a Navajo who was engaged to take them as far as Pueblo Benito and leave them. About noon, Richard called the Palmer's attention to a landmark of three jutting peaks of El Huerfano, some thirty miles to the east. Almost due south of those peaks, another thirty miles, they would find the Chaco. Since crossing the San Juan, they had seen many signs of the Navajo, flocks of sheep moving in slow white patches through the pale green sagebrush, smoke rising in cold air and straight plumes from far-off Hogan's, and, now and then, two or three blanketed riders, men and women both, who rarely came close but from a distance stopped and stared curiously at the white strangers. Some of the men carried guns across their saddles, and Marietta had a twinge of certainty the guns were not loaded for small game alone. But then, glancing toward the man in the spring wagon, she drew reassurance because in Richard's attitude there was no trace of concern. She was riding Knocky, a bay mare Richard let her choose from the Alamo Ranch, and as the horse trotted on the flanks or in advance of the small caravan, Marietta was conscious that Richard's eyes were upon her as often as they studied the landscape. The shyness she had felt and first felt in his presence was disappearing. More and more she reined in her horse to keep pace with his wagon, and she and Richard found so much to talk about the miles fell away unnoticed. Her ideas of him were changing rapidly. He was not as old or stern as she had thought. She discovered she could make him smile and even laugh. On the morning of the sixth day, they crossed an expanse of sandy desert reaching the Chaco Wash, several miles west of where Escavada comes into it at an angle from the northeast. Both stream beds, however, were absolutely dry. This indeed was a wilderness, Marietta thought, with no trees anywhere, and not even a bird's cry to break the silence. Few Hogans had been seen, few poor cornfields, but these Indians had few horses and no wagons at all, so the country they were traveling was trackless and desolate. Their guide turned off to the left and was now leading them along the north side of Chaco Arroyo and toward a wide, low gap between two mesas, which showed across the horizons only outcroppings of stone and scattered clumps of dwarf juniper. Now the ground was firmer, and less dragging under the wagon wheels, and they entered the canyon. It was quite wide, perhaps half a mile, Chaco Wash cutting in deep, twisting bed worn by years of erosion. The floor of which they were riding was a chalky color dotted with clumps of grass and greasewood, nearly flat but rising almost imperceptibly to the east. As they progressed further, the canyon deepened, its tawny walls now rising 200 feet between the occasional outjutting rincons. On the mesa on the right, outlined against the sky, 
Richard saw the dark brown walls of ruined Penasco Blanco. Soon after, they passed close by two smaller ruins on the canyon floor, and finally they were in sight of the great Pueblo ruin which had brought them there, Pueblo Benito, the beautiful village. They unhitched the wagons and made camp under the dark north wall of Benito, where having masonry tapers gradually upwards to a height of four stories. For once, Richard's usual gravity deserted him. Golden light of the late October afternoon slanted down through the canyon, burnishing the sandstone cliffs. Before the sun sank behind the Lokachkis, he climbed through the vast arc of tumbled masonry and high crumbling walls that was Benito. He quickly inspected Pueblo del Arroyo, a few hundred yards to the west, and Benito's twin giant, Chetro Ketel, a quarter mile to the east. In returning, he discovered behind Benito the ancient stairs and toeholds the Anasazi had cut through a chimney in the canyon wall. Climbing these, he emerged on a bare rim of rock was now scoured by a driving wind. Spread out directly below him was the immense half-moon of Pueblo Benito, shadowy in the fading light, its outer walls reaching in an open-armed embrace toward the canyon. Far on the other side of the arroyo were mounds, which he knew meant the presence of other ruins. It was a moment of intense, unward emotion for Richard. All that he was looking upon far surpassed anything he imagined. These great pueblos dwarfed everything he had seen before. Cliff Palace or Quetzal could be lost in one curving wing of this giant called Benito. Only a cold wind whipping through his sheepskin jacket reminded him of his responsibility to the family waiting for him. But his excitement increased as he descended from the top of the mesa. Untold treasures of a vanished civilization lay buried here. Where was a man to start? And I feel like New York City. Get me to the farm.